Hey, lovely. Well, Croeso, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to the second and final of our Scorsiae Tir Hov, Queer Perspectives, The Land, uh, curated by Kerry Ann Wilshire Davis. Um, can you make sure you're muted? I think there's a, there's a bit of rustling coming through. Thank you. The uh, Enu E Adi Emily Loro. My name is Emily Loro, and I am Community Art Coordinator at Oriel Martin Gallery in Carmarthen. This talk is part of the Winter of Wellbeing, funded by Welsh Government in partnership with the Federation of Museums and Art Galleries and Amgiadva Cymru National Museum Wales. So I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Sorry, there's people coming in. I'm just going to admit them. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping and then I'm going to hand over to Kerry Ann. So if you could stay muted unless you're invited to unmute that would be great um like i said we're recording so please turn your camera off if you if you don't want to be on the recording i think actually zoom records speaker view so i don't think you are recorded anyway um but yeah feel free to turn your camera off we will be uh putting this talk on our youtube channel and last week's talk with Abby Paulson will also be on our YouTube channel. So if you, uh, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, Oriel Marathon Gallery, you'll, you'll, you can see those films. There's lots of really great films on there as well. Um, or follow us on social media and we'll, we'll, we'll post when we, when we put them up on YouTube. Um, we will have a break halfway through um, please use the chat function. Someone is still joining. They're missing the housekeeping. Um, uh, yeah, use the chat function and there'll be, there'll be a little bit of time for questions and discussion at the end. We should be finished by 9 p.m. Um, we have evaluation to do, of course, because this is a funded project, as I mentioned. So I am going to put evaluation questions in the chat. We'd be very, very grateful if you can answer those. There's also a link to another set of evaluation that the Welsh Government is doing. So if you could click on that link and answer them. I think it's just a couple of minutes. It's very basic. Um, but as I know... Lots of you work in the arts, evaluation is very important. So we really appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to do that. Um, so, great, thanks for coming. And I'm gonna hand over to Kerry Ann. Dior. Great, thank you, Emily. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so this talk is like gonna be, the first half is gonna be um, myself, Izzy and Yana giving sort of 20 minutes um, talks on our practices and work then we'll have a little break and come back and then we'll have a sort of like um, interview conversation between the three of us about our um, connection as queer people to Wales and it'll be a chance at the end for a Q&A and you guys to answer the questions if you are if you want to join the conversation yeah so I'll just share my screen and I'll do the presentation first um, Hang on, let me just make sure. Can you all see that? Yeah? Cool. Okay, so a bit about me. I'm a queer artist, facilitator and theatre maker originally from Brynamon in Carmarthenshire and my work focuses on platforming marginalised voices, especially the voices of LGBTQ plus people. And the, ma the majority of work I've done over the last year has been um, focused on queer ecology and connections to Welsh landscape and heritage. Uh, growing up queer in Wales and working class um, from a very rural community can be really ex isolating and difficult. And um, I definitely felt that when growing up as a queer person. But I've always had a strong connection to Welsh landscape and both my parents were travellers. So engaging with the land and being outdoors in the landscape was an integral part of my life. It also offered a space um, for me to like feel like a relief and um, a space for me to be able to like question my identity and not feel like 
I've been judged in any way. And for me, the natural environment is just a completely non-judgmental space. One of the only spaces where you're not being um, perceived, which is such a nice feeling, especially if um, you are someone who identifies as something other than what people generally perceive you as. Uh, so that's why I believe forging these connections between LGBTQ plus people living in Wales and the landscape is so important when trying to um, trying to engage and encourage a sense of belonging in Wales. Connections to Welsh heritage is also equally important as it's such a fundamental part of Welsh identity. Throughout all of our schooling, we are taught about Welsh history and folklore and heritage sites are embedded across all of Wales. So I think a big part of feeling like you belong in Wales is feeling represented within that. So a lot of my work has been about teaching others and about LGBTQ plus Welsh history and the stories of individual people within that. So um, a project I did at university was called Queer Cymru. I consist, it consisted of a series of workshops run in different areas in Wales to different age ranges of queer people. Um, the workshops the workshops consisted of exercises that reimagined Welsh traditions and explored the lives of queer people in Wales throughout history. So to accompany these workshops, I created a zine that was informed by the queer Welsh figures and my ideas on how Welsh traditions can be reclaimed by queer people today. Um, so these are just some examples of pages. If people want to see the zine, I can, um, they can email me. I'll give my email at the end and I can send it to them. So some examples of an exercise I ran was um, to design your own love spoon. Love spoons are traditionally love tokens made to, to be given to someone else. But I asked the groups to design love spoons for themselves. Um, they could use traditional love spoon symbols, LGBTQ plus symbols and symbols they created for themselves. And what I like about love spoons is that there is a meaning to all the iconography on them and the fact that the use of symbols is used in both love spoons and to express LGBTQ plus identities. Um, the purpose of these workshops were to forge strong connections between queer people and their locality and to make space for them to learn about Welsh history and to interrogate their feelings on Welsh landscape and heritage in a way that might not have been offered to them before. And the majority of participants of the, all the workshops hadn't really heard of much of the history I presented to them. Um, so it was really great to be able to help them feel represented in Welsh history. Um, I then developed a solo show based around the materials um, from the workshop. Um, in the show, I played a queer Welsh tour guide that delivers tours around Wales on a bus um, to destinations where like queer Welsh figures lived. Um, Currently, myself and my friend are developing a show as a two-person show that we hope to tour around Wales and to deliver workshops for queer, pe uh, for queer people in the areas that we tour to based around the themes of the show. Um, another big bit of work I did last year was um, Hin Ladain Plant, uh, which was a project with National Theatre Wales and National Resources Wales. Uh, the project invited a small group of artists from different backgrounds and practices to conduct creative research projects that explore and reimagine our relationship with the environment and communities. Um, it wasn't the typical kind of residency where everyone is in the same place. Instead, we all conducted the residencies in our chosen hyper-local spaces. So everyone was based all across Wales. We met online every week and discussed our progress, thoughts and gave responses and feedback to each other's work. So even though we weren't all in the same place, we all impacted on each other's work. And as part of the residency, we had to engage a community group or group of people in some way with the work. Uh, one of the things I really enjoyed about this project was the fact it wasn't uh, focused on outcomes. It was more about the journey of your investigation and the conversations and opportunities that came from it. So um, I'm going to talk to you about my investigation for a bit. So this is quite a big segment just see, and um, yeah, so I'll just talk you through what happened in the project. So the project aimed to investigate whether the theory of queer ecology can be used to influence and inspire people to change the way they view and interact with the environment in order to create a community that's more mindful, balanced with nature and more empathetic of their surroundings. So queer ecology is the idea of queering perspectives on the environment and natural landscapes, um, a lot of Western mainstream ideas and attitudes we have towards the environment derived from a very binary, heteronormative, ableist and colonialist perspective. 
So our society kind of views humans as separate from nature and sees the environment as a space to dominate and extract from. So instead of seeing ourselves as separate from nature, queer ecology invites us to reimagine ourselves as part of nature. Because separating ourselves, separating ourselves from nature, seeing things as human or not human, natural or unnatural, encourages a divide between us and nature, but also each other. Sorry, <laughs> I got loads of paper, so it's really rustly. Um, so I chose the Sundi and Gower Coast as my space for the hyperlocal residency. I chose this space because I have developed a strong connection to it over the last year since moving to Swansea. Um, and over lockdown, I, over lockdown, I spent a lot of time walking the Gower coastline and just being at Swansea Beach. So this was a therapeutic experience for me. Um, I feel like I forged a connection to the coast that I hadn't really experienced before. And it also gave me the space to start thinking more deeply about my queer identity and uh, being at the coast offered somewhere that was non-judgmental and accepting. In this space, I started to think about my queer identity and my connection to Wales and about how both of these things were really intertwined for me. Um, part of this investigation was wanting to see if other LGBTQ plus people had also made these connections, uh, why those connections are there and how we can forge stronger connections between queer people in Wales. So I went about the investigation by going on lots and lots of walks on the coast and having conversations with other queer people about their relationships with the coast, natural landscapes and community. I also ran creative workshops with LGBTQ plus people at Swansea Beach, um, exploring these themes. Um, I also made a video after going on a walk with my partner to one of the highest points we can easily walk to in Swansea. Uh, we walked down through uh, Rose Hill Quarry Park where we found a labyrinth pattern on the ground that was made out of shells from the beach. Uh, this got us thinking about liminal spaces and how the beach is a liminal, a liminal space where like the sea meets the land. And um, we were thinking about identity and, and, and like the fact we're both non-binary, which is a sort of state of in-between or other that could be one of the reasons we connect to the landscape as a liminal space. Um, so I'm gonna show you the video that we made. It's quite rough, but it was just kind of about my journey and what I was thinking at the time. What does the labyrinth represent? Uh, so it's like a journey and if you follow it, you can go into the next world. And it's like the crossing point of between the two. It's about a sort of liminal space as well. Um, I hope you all, I hope you could hear the sound on that. Um, I'm not sure. But yeah, I interviewed around uh, 20 people and I'm still continuing to do so. Um, this project's sort of ongoing, even though the sort of time scale of the project ended, but I'm continuing it. And I interviewed um, people with a very, with varied LGBTQ plus identities and backgrounds. And I've been transcribing these interviews and putting them into a sort of blog, um, which I can also share with you. At the end, um, a lot of people reached out to me, not only from Swansea, but from all over Wales, and some originally from Wales, some that chose to move to Wales, and some people that 
aren't from here but have a strong connection to um, Wales, Welsh landscape or the coast. So although this um, Although this project starting point was at Swansea and the Gow Coast, I feel that throughout the project it really expanded, it transformed into a project that was looking at queer people's connection to landscape and the environment all over Wales and exploring the participants ideas, hopes for the future and thoughts about those spaces. Um, I didn't expect as many people to contact me as they did, which I think really shows the need for these conversations to take place and also the connections that do exist between queer people and the natural landscape and the environment. Um, this is just an example of like, the call out post I created when um, looking for people to interview. Um, yeah, so the questions that I asked in the interviews, um, these are the questions basically, they did change a bit depending on the conversations we were having and like who the people were. Um, but it was, do you feel connected to Wales as a queer person? What's your relationship to Wales as a natural landscape? Uh, what specific landscapes do you connect with the most? Um, do you think that your queer identity has an effect on your perspective on the environment and community? Um, what does the future of cohabiting and coexisting with the natural environment in Wales look like to you? Do you think the outlooks and, and attitudes of queer people could influence others to change and adopt queer outlooks towards the environment and community? And do you think encouraging queer people to connect to the natural environment is, in Wales could help build a stronger sense of belonging within Wales? Uh, so some of these questions are the questions I'll be asking uh, Yenna and Izzy at the end when we have our conversation and hopefully some of you guys would feel like um, sharing your thoughts on these questions as well. So um, many of the people that reached out to me were either from coastal areas in Wales or rural areas. Most of the people felt very conflicting emotions to rural spaces. On one hand, they felt that the rural space they grew up in were extremely isolating and abrasive for queer people. But on the other hand, they felt like the natural landscape offered a, a non-judgmental space where they could connect with the environment and their identity. So this feeling of isolation in rural spaces causes a lot of young queer people to leave Wales and to move to more urban spaces outside of Wales where they feel more accepted and part of a community. This then leads to even less representation for queer people in rural areas, making the issue even worse. Um, in my opinion, there is a current like influx of queer people moving back to Wales after moving away. And a lot of people I know, including myself, have done this. And it's something that really came up a lot in interviews as something people have noticed happening. Um, it feels like now is just a really great time to create this representation in Wales for queer people and to build upon the growing queer communities in Wales. So during these conversations, I really started to realise that although I grew up in a really rural area in Wales, I was really fortunate to have a lot of queer influences when I was younger. I, um, sorry, I've lost my place. Oh, here we go. I was a part of a youth theatre that hired a lot of LGBTQ plus artists to work with young people. And this experience really solidified my connection to Wales as a queer person because I felt represented and part of a community within it. And without those experiences of being around other LGBTQ plus people growing up, I think that I wouldn't have a very different relationship to Wales than I do now. Um, which is why I'm doing all of this work, basically, because I just think it's so vital. And uh, another sort of issue people had in the interviews was access to the environment, because um, that's like a massive issue for marginalized people. Um, there's different factors that affect this, but one that came up in the interviews were uh, traveling to natural spaces. So if you don't have a car, it's really difficult, or it could potentially be really expensive to travel on public transport to these places. And feeling safe and included in outdoor spaces. Um, some people I interviewed expressed not feeling welcome in outdoors groups or environmental groups. Also just the feeling of not being safe as a queer person in those spaces. Um, these worries tended to be weighted on how other people perceive and interact with them in those spaces. So it's not about like the landscape itself, about the people um, that engage with it, engage with it as well, basically. Uh, some people that I interviewed felt left out or unwelcome from environmentalism or engaging with the environment. And from reading about queer ecology, there's always a point made that queer people can be left out of environmentalism 
because there's this misconception that because um, LGBTQ plus people are less likely to have children that they don't think to the future in the same way cisgendered heterosexual people do. So this can also lead to harmful misconceptions such as queer people are too self-centered or hedonistic to think of the future and the environment. Um, one person that I interviewed who was queer actually made this point when they were talking about um, LGBTQ plus people's connection to the environment. He felt that the queer people um, are too sort of self-centered to actually care about the environment. Uh, on the flip side of that, though, um, the majority of people I spoke to were very passionate about environmental issues and protecting the environment, even if some people didn't know how they could do anything to help or felt overwhelmed by it. Throughout these interviews, I was constantly reminded of the compassion and unity that queer people show to each other as a community. And I think this is something um, that really that's really translatable to the way we treat the environment and build wider communities. Um, this is a example of someone's answer to the question, do you feel connected to the coast as a queer person? Um, I'll, I'll read it out, so it's definitely, but I don't know if this is like a really personal relationship. I'm sure that it's not universal, but the beach and the dunes and things like that for a queer person is really important. So I lived really rurally, so one of the places I um, I ever was either with my family because they could they could take me places school or at home so I didn't really have any place to like experiment with the fact that I was trans or gay or sexually active in any of those things. For me it's definitely become this area where I feel like it's a no man's land it's private no one can really question you it's all about the joy of a public space but also with the privacy of the natural geography and things like that. You're not going to like a national park or anything. You're just going to the beach. No one can stop anyone from going to the beach. Um, so this is the, I'm gonna talk about the workshops a bit. So in October last year, I ran a workshop at the beach and nine people attended and about half the participants lived in or around Swansea or traveled from Cardiff or West Wales. Uh, the workshop itself was creative, starting off with a grounding exercise that got the participants to connect with their surroundings. I then ran exercises that encouraged the participants to interact with the space they were in, either in groups or individually. Um, there was also free writing and drawing exercises where I asked participants to respond to prompts. So um, I found that creating the space for queer people to interact with the um, with each other and the environment is one of the most effective ways to encourage a sense of belonging within that space. By the end of the workshop, everyone had generated a creative outcome and had conversations with and shared something with the rest of the group. I gave everyone a notebook and at the beginning of the workshop, um, I asked them to write and draw in it throughout the time that they were there. So here's a page that I thought was interesting from one of the participants' notebooks. Um, and I'm also gonna just play a poem um, that one of the young people, or a couple of poems that one of the young people let me record. I hope they don't mind me playing it, but yeah. Okay, there was only so much I could write for um, connecting to whales through being queer. I wrote, Land of dragons, mighty warriors, ancient language, beautiful world, queer as the world. For myself and the environment, I wrote, single living thing can only do so much, but I love this world. It's incredible, it's fearless, it's tough. I want to save it, keep it safe, but I am only one. So I'll work with others to keep the world safe. And with connection to this moment, this place, I wrote, wind whipping my face, dogs barking in tandem, salty air, sunny sea reaching the horizon, saliva on my tongue, wanting water. My emotions bubble under me, through my breath, through my heartbeat, content to be with my peers, queer and Welsh like me, wanting happiness like me, being creative like me. I love this country. Uh, I hope everyone can hear that. But yeah, it was really, it was really cool. Um, so yeah, this is the group. Um, yeah, I'm continuing to interview people and, a, and I am thinking about making a podcast out of the conversations that I'm having that I've recorded and ones I continue to do so. 
Um, if anyone is interested in chatting to me or having an interview with me, um, please send me an email. I'd really appreciate that. Um, so finally, um, I currently work for um, Giver Cymru as a youth engagement facilitator and over the last year I've developed a LGBTQ plus project for young people aged 16 to 25 called Trust Newid. The, ex, um, the project explores LGBT Welsh history and the lived experiences of queer people today. Um, the group have developed an exhibition that is currently on display at the Waterfront Museum until the 31st of July. And the exhibition consists of, project, of objects from Amgiver Cymru's LGBTQ plus collection and artworks created by the young people in response to the collection and their own experiences of being um, queer in Wales. Yeah, so that's kind of all I got. I'll stop sharing. Yeah, I hope you can all hear that. Did you hear the poem? Yeah, cool. Okay, cool. Amazing. Thank you. And I'm going to pass over to um, Yana next to do that. Talk. Oh, you're on mute, Yana. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here and I'm really excited to be doing this with Oriol Madden as well, because um, I'm from Carmarthen and I went to um, Carmarthen um, Art College for Foundation. So yeah, it's just really exciting to be virtually back. Um, I'm gonna share my a little presentation where I'm gonna talk about um, what I've been up to, my work. Um, I, I'm an art graduate. I graduated relatively recently um, and I just wanted to share a bit of what I've been doing. So I will share my screen. in just a second. Go. Um, so yes, um, my name is Yana. Um, I'm non-binary. I use they, them pronouns. And yeah, I'm originally from Carmarthen and I'm now based in London and have been for about six years now. Um, I thought I'd start off with just showing you my studio. It's just like an initial introduction to what kind of, what my making kind of looks like. Um, this is a studio I've had for about a year. Um, I share it with four others. It's kind of all my making bits all my materials, just bits and bobs I'm playing around with. On the top right there's uh, like a work in progress model, which you'll see more of later. And uh, that's my studio, uh, studio mate covered in something called alginate to make a, a kind of a face cast. <laughs> um, Generally, when I make stuff, when I make physical stuff, I'm really into um, kind of completely altering indoor spaces and kind of really transforming um, transforming the space I have access to kind of quite unrecognizably. So on the left is um, kind of something I worked on where I actually turned my studio into a kind of like uh, faux um, interior domestic space and um, on the right that's actually a kind of work in progress picture from my degree show where I was using um, lots and lots of really heavy materials to um, push in the space. Um, 
but I will show you more of that in a bit. I just thought I'd show you that initially. Um, but really, first off, I wanted to share with you all um, kind of some bits of my research that is kind of ongoing. I did write an essay, but I kind of want this to be an ongoing project. Um, I called the essay um, an image of Bochantleth. Um, and this project is a sort of case study in which I chose the town of Bochantleth to base my kind of examination. Um, I would say this is a this is a project about particularly environmentalism in Wales um, and kind of a process of identifying a kind of culture war at the heart of Welsh politics and environmentalism. Um, I chose Macunfith as a kind of um, base for my study. Um, I think a lot of this research is really relevant to um, all over Wales, West Wales, Bath in particular. Um, but I found in Macunfith a lot of the kind of uh, kind of indicators around the town are kind of particularly stuck. Um, so I don't know if anyone, I don't know how well people know Macunfith, um, but. Um, it's a small town, it's South Snowdonia, um, very beautiful little place. Um, and it's kind of quite well known for having a quite high, um, proportionately large Welsh speaking demographic. Um, it's historically synonymous with the name um, of Owain Glyndwr who um, led an ill-fated rebellion against the English crown in the, 19, in the 1400s. <laughs> um, oops. And it's also got a bit of a reputation for being um, a kind of environmental hotspot. Um, according to the Guardian newspaper, when it featured its uh, le let's move to property column, um, they said about Macunfith, if any place in Britain could be called a sustainable capital, it's Macunfith. So um, this kind of, this proud Welshness and this kind of um, environmental reputation, I think creates a kind of dual identity for the town. Um, and I think, to understand kind of environmentalism as we know it in Wales today, we kind of need to look back at where it kind of comes from. And particularly to understand projects like, I don't know if you've heard of them, but projects like Lamas and uh, communities like Brithdia and more locally, um, Tipi Valley near Carmarthen. So, um, In the 70s, um, lots of hippies moved to Wales, basically. Um, I really love these images. Um, very romantic, beautiful images, very bucolic, idealized images. Um, so yes, lots of people moved in the 70s, um, motivated by a desire to escape urban life and return to a simpler, more ecologically conscious way of living. Um, they're kind of referred to historically as first wave or the 70s generation. Um, so of course, this relatively large number of people moving into Wales at that time obviously had an impact. And this is, a, this is not long after in California, um, lots of young middle-class um, kind of idealistic people moved out into the hills. In the UK, there was a kind of similar impulse, but um, there was no kind of vast American 
wilderness. So it had to be had to be Wales. Um, this was in Machanlith as well in the 1970s, and a big reason why Machanlith is so has such a reputation for environmentalism is because of CAT or the Centre for Alternative Technology. And the Centre for Alternative Technology is um, situated just three miles north of Machanlith, and it's on the site of a disused quarry. And it was born as a site to test, develop, and demonstrate renewable energy solutions in 1973. Um, these days, it's popular visitor experience. They offer postgraduate school, and it is it's really like a unique site um, in Europe, really. Um, and in the 1970s, like local reaction to this place being started up and up originally as a kind of commune. Um, there's not much documentation of um, local reaction. Um, there's a bit. And I mean, something that stands out for me is uh, comments from a local farmer, which I found, um, where he said, we had just about got into Maine's electricity and we'd left our turbines, our generator sets and our, um, sorry. Basically they had um, replaced all their old hydro electric kind of contraptions for electricity, mains electricity. And this had just happened. And this um, site came and was testing or developing these um, supposedly new technologies where the local population had only just moved on to mains electricity and had moved on from this kind of technology. Um, and for me, uh, I'm really interested in um, a kind of friction between these, um, the culture surrounding environmentalism, particularly from um, this kind of 70s hippie movement and friction between local populations, Welsh speaking populations and the way they perceive each other. Um, there's, there's been, I mean, Kat's been there for 40 years now, at least. And um, I, you know, I've read in 2007, there was not a single Welsh um, member of staff, Welsh speaking member of staff. And there's kind of anecdotal stories about um, uh, members of staff being scolded for speaking Welsh in the, um, in the cafe and things like this. So I, I, I kind of highlight this is an example of a lack of integration and a kind of um, a kind of bit of a battleground, really. Just move on now. My slides aren't moving. Are you clicking on the screen, Yana? Yeah. Ah, there we are. Um, this is a picture of, um, this, is, this picture really makes me laugh. This is a picture of George Monbiot. He's a really prominent environmental writer. He's very successful. He's very important in many ways. And he actually lives in Machandlis. And he's been a very vocal um, critic of um, of um, farming, sheep farming in particular, and its impact on hillsides. Um, and he's um, popularized the idea of rewilding. And rewilding is the idea of allowing large swathes of land to return to what is what would essentially be its natural state. And um, 
this is a very, this is quite a kind of exciting idea in many ways. But um, in the context of rural Wales, there's been a lot of pushback, local pushback. And I think, um, there's been a lot of pushback. And one example of this, I'll show you here, is there's a big sign outside Machancliff and um, it reads, Dweid nai I wish jo, um, say no to rewilding. And beneath the main text, it's daubed on Coveroch-Torellin in reference to the original mural on the left, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, I think this is significant um, as it directly refers to a famous slogan and it's just a visual exemplification of a real disconnect and kind of um, conflict. Um, of course, Kovyoch Dwellin refers to the flooding of a North Walian village in the 1960s to supply Liverpool with fresh drinking water. And what's being referenced here on this anti-rewilding sign is um, that same feeling that um, the land is being repurposed or reappropriated for external means, say, uh, wild camping or tourism. Um, that's been my ongoing research and I've been really interested in these kind of like visual signifiers on the landscape. And um, a lot of this research really feeds into my physical practice. And I wanted to move on to show you um, an installation I did last year. Um, this is it. Um, it was a lot of work, a lot of really heavy materials. Um, I got all the wood for free from uh, local uh, tree surgeons. Some of it was from the park. Um, felled logs in the park, which I went down and got with a trolley. Um, the clay was all local, came from someone digging up their garden to make a patio. Um, it was, this was tons of materials, which I got for free, which was quite, it was quite remarkable, sort of kind of like an urban area. Um, yeah, lots of logs. I was quite lucky. Um, there was a tree that fell down um, outside the college in the week of the build and the tree surgeons very conveniently cut it, cut these massive, massive discs that I went down and used. Um, bottles in the wall um, reference uh, the kind of building style that has been made popular by figures like um, Tony Wrench, who created a, what he calls a low impact roundhouse at Bristian Moor in West Wales. Um, this building has been threatened with um, being pulled down for years and years. And this, and this community, Bristia, is very, very much um, a kind of, a, as a result of the 70s influx that I've been speaking about. Um, got my road sign, um, Penchlev Eco, Eco Village. And this, this um, installation, I really wanted it to kind of operate as a kind of museum piece, a kind of retrospective, point of view on this kind of, this history, which I think is potentially quite under, um, underrepresented and, und and not little spoke about, but I think is really fundamental to understanding the challenges 
um, of environmentalism within Wales at the moment. And um, I thought for a bit of a breather, I could show you the video that accompanied this um, installation. Um, this one here showing in the oven TV. So I will play that now. It's about seven minutes. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's a nice respite for me talking. <laughs> Um, but yeah, here he is. I've got some good friends among the Welsh farmers. I've got some, you know, real Welsh friends, but basically they're very suspicious of you at first. I mean, I think people ought to be able to do what they like on their own property, as long as they don't tread on their neighbor's toes. When my mum came, I think she was quite impressed, you know. And she wrote and said that she thought that we were the true pioneers of the post-industrial age. <laughs> it was lovely.
Um, hi everyone, um, thank you for watching that, um, yeah, um, I'm looking forward to talking um, to Kerry in a little bit and um, I'm happy to answer any questions after if people want to ask me anything about the film, but I'm also aware of time and um, I'm definitely running over, so I just wanted to very quickly show you what I've been doing very recently. Um, quite excitingly, I made a coracle um, out of a combination of recycled materials, including tubing from a old trampoline and some blue water pipe, quite a lot of blue water pipe. And this was for a show that me and some friends, other artists, um, did on the banks of the Thames in Deptford. Um, it was really exciting. This is a beach that's only accessible at low tide. So we had a very small window of opportunity to get down there, set everything up, get everyone down, do our performances. There was a series of performances. Um, we brought lighting down, we had a fire, we had music. Um, yeah, it was, it was really good fun and it was, really exciting to use a very um a, a space that's only accessible at certain times but is also completely free to use we didn't get any permission we just did it and just waited for the tide to let us um here's some more images and on the bottom left here is me um in my little coracle in the thames which was as scary as it looked. I was tied to the side and I was wearing a life jacket. <laughs> um, here's me bobbing about in the lake, yeah, testing it out. We... They can swim very well. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked and it only leaked a little bit. Um, I don't know why I chucked this in. Um, you'll notice in the film, there was lots of references to world building, lots of fantasy elements, um, lots of references to Lord of the Rings. And I think there's lots of connections between these kind of fantasy impulses and that of um, the kind of Back to the land movement, um, you know, these, that I'd be a lot of the dwellings, the low impact roundhouses have like a striking resemblance to um, old Celtic roundhouses and to kind of J.R. Tolkien um, kind of fantasy worlds. And I guess I see a lot of parallels between kind of these kind of this fantasy fiction and a kind of 
back to the land um, kind of trajectory. And here is a comparison between that and Teletubby. So I was trying to say that, like this comparison, I'm making another comparison, but I'm really into this comparison too. <laughs> Um, oh, and then I just made like a collage about um, me and my practice and where things come from. Um, um, oops. Oh, it's not letting me show it full screen. Yeah. Um, here's the peanut butter. This is my, my um, hippie influx um, heritage. Um, Here's the mountains, here's the low impact roundhouse, here's the Celts. Um, and here, of course, is the influence of popular culture, um, which I um, reference all the time and um, I love. Um, thank you very, very much, everyone, for listening. Sorry for running over time. I am going to stop sharing and pass on to. Izzy, thank you very much. Oh, we're just gonna, I think before we go to Izzy, I think we're gonna have a break now because I've been aware like you guys have been listening to us talk for a while. <laughs> um, thank you, Yana, that was great though. And should we take a like very quick, like sort of five to seven minute break? Like, is that okay? Yeah, make a cup of tea, have a pee, cool. Thank you guys, see you in a bit.
Um, yeah, should we start coming back if you guys are back? That'd be great. Great. Um, so I think should we should we get started? I think it'd be good to get started with Izzy. So I'll pass over to Izzy. Thanks. Hello. I'm just gonna start my PowerPoint. I was gonna start without sharing it, then that wouldn't be much use. Um, here we are. So yeah. Um, here we are. Um, my talk is gonna focus a bit on sort of my connection to landscape and the art and as an artist, but also how that links into rest and joy and sort of climate justice, because that's the side of things I come up things up. So I'm Izzy, um, I'm non-binary, I use they them pronouns, and I'm a climate organiser, blogger, artist, and also a scientist. Um, my sort of formal education is a science background, because um, I did a BSc in astrophysics and then went into renewable energy, but my art side comes from sort of a blogging side of things. I founded the Sustainable Living blog with Quirky Environmentalist around six years ago now. And about two years ago, I founded the campaign Who Made My Pride Merch, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, but that focuses on sustainable and ethical fashion, um, as well as LGBT Cuba's garment worker rights. Um, most of the work that I do focuses on sort of climate justice and intersectional environmentalism, with sort of a strong focus on sustainable and ethical fashion, but I come in and do lots of other bits in terms of sustainability as well. Um, and I'm also a big old queer, so that shapes a lot of the things that I do. Um, yeah, it's just sort of in there, can't really help that. Um, and in terms of like my art, I'm definitely not a traditional artist in any sense of the word, but um, I tend to use art to support a lot of the campaigning and blogging work that I do, um, as well as just to, to support me as a human being. Um, and my work tends to revolve around sort of photography and digital art, but also textile art. I do a lot of embroidery, mending and upcycling and run workshops, teaching other people to do those things as well. So um, I'm first gonna talk about sort of where I started with fashion blogging. And just as a heads up, because um, a lot of my art journey has been through fashion blogging and social media, you are gonna see an awful lot of pictures of me in this presentation. It was very me centered, so you have been warned. Um, but yeah, I started off as a fashion blogger probably when I was about 13. These pictures are from when I was around 17. Um, and this kind of allowed me as a very shy, often gender non-conforming teenager who um, went in and out of having friends to just express myself. Um, it allowed me to experiment with fashion, to photography and editing and all of those sorts of things. And often I would end up in quiet places near where I lived. These would be sort of parks or the beach, just places where I could go and take pictures of myself without people watching me do that, because that always felt really weird. <laughs> and um, often what I'd do is I'd set my camera up and if I heard someone coming, I'd hide behind the camera and pretend I was just taking a picture of the scene in front of me and not myself. Um, but these two pictures are from the same park um, near where I grew up. And I think this is where my connection to nature without me realizing it kind of started because I just spent a lot of time out and about taking pictures um, and existing in nature. And when I look at these photos, especially the one on the bottom right, I can kind of smell the wild garlic that grew around here. And it's quite funny as I was putting this um, together, someone I follow on Instagram shared their guide to Cardiff's um, wild garlic spots. And this park was in there and also a park right by where I live and I've just moved to was in there. So I'm sort of like, oh, I can go and explore new wild garlic spots. Um, but that was just a funny connection here. Um, so yeah, I started off taking a lot of photos of myself, posting them online. Um, and you can see here how I'm using kind of the same spots year after year. This is Cosmeston, um, just outside of Cardiff. And this is the same sort of bit of um, path. The picture on the left, I am 17. And the picture on the right was a few months ago um at 24 and the picture on the right is also when I documented my first ever foraging walk I started foraging um during lockdown as a way to sort of connect with the world around me and from a sustainability point of view to try and get a little bit of my own food and I have the pictures from that here so the two pictures on the left are from that first foraging journey um and <laughs> 
I have to say that A, mushrooms make great photos, which is why I love going out and finding them. And I consider them part of queer culture fully. Like they're not understood like sex, sex wise, especially when they were first discovered. People tried to sex them like they sexed plants and humans and it didn't work and they were confused by it. And I, I relate to that. Um, the mushroom on the left, couldn't tell you what it is. Um, it's a brown mushroom. There's a lot of them. I've tried to identify it. It, it didn't go very well. Um, the one in the middle is the glistening ink cap. And what I really want to do is go back to this spot next year because they're not in season anymore and collect some and make ink out of them for my foraging diary because that, I don't know, it feels appropriate. But um, there's no pictures of my foraging diary in this because I haven't done much in it yet. But the intention is there for that to be part of my art journey. And then the picture on the right, this very cool looking mushroom is um, a lion's mane mushroom. This was not foraged. You're not allowed to forage these in the UK because they're endangered. But I grew this from a kit. Um, tasted a bit weird, I'm not gonna lie, after all that I've grown it, but they do look really cool. And it was really cool to grow a mushroom and then um, eat it. But this is something that I started in lockdown and kind of gets me on to, I guess, how I deepen my connection with nature to lockdown and sort of recognize it a lot more. I know I'm not the only person who through lockdown lost my connection to an in-person community, especially a queer community. And sort of within that, I ended up clinging to and cultivating my connection with nature. I moved back to Cardiff just before lockdown hit and I came in and I was like, oh, I'm just gonna work a bit and then go traveling. So I didn't bother to make those connections. And suddenly I was stuck at home in my bedroom trying to do my master's degree with no connection to anyone that I had before. And where I used to go out and, you know, do stuff with people to bring me a lot of joy and as a way to sort of empty my bucket or fill it depending on which way you like to think about that sort of thing um it having that connection with nature kind of not entirely replaced because I don't think you can now my connection to community especially queer community is still as invaluable as ever but having that connection to nature helped I guess soften the blow and give me something to um do and to find rest in and to measure time differently. Um, this is a picture of me for a Fashion Revolution um, Week campaign, sat in my parents' garden because we weren't allowed to go anywhere else <laughs> um, and trying to make art just at home. I took a lot of pictures in my parents' garden. Um, and I think that connection to nature sort of grew. This is a piece that I um, made back in December. I'm someone who's always suffered with seasonal affective disorder. And I know even people who don't tend to end up slowing down in winter and it can be quite frustrating as within society everything seems to keep going and you're expected to do all the same things but actually your body is going no I need to slow down it's winter and I would get so so um what is the word I'm looking for frustrated with the fact that my body was slowing down I wanted to keep going and keep thriving but looking at the world around me I was kind of seeing how most things don't bloom all year round most things hibernate, slow down, stop for the winter. And this was kind of me going, okay, let's take a leaf, or I suppose more of a pine needle, because there aren't that many leaves out during winter out of nature's book and just let myself slow down. Not completely, because I have responsibilities and bills to pay, but somewhat. And this piece was kind of born out of that. And I think in a lot of the work that I do, because it's based around sustainability and the environment, there's a very clear link between that and the landscape. We talk a lot about things like reforesting and rewilding, about conserving species, about preventing pollution. And this is all sort of focused around preserving the natural environment. But I think there's so much more to it than just save the trees, save the animals. As important as these things are, I'm not gonna say that they're not, but I think that people have so much to gain from having access to these places and from having um, connection to these spaces as well. And the piece on the right, this is just a sort of little painting that I've had since I was a teenager and I tend to paint in it when I'm stressed or not feeling great. And this was a reminder to myself a little while ago that rest is not something that I have to earn or have to go out and get. It's just something that I need that is innate to me. And the greener in the background is definitely because my connection to nature at the time was kind of I know now if I go out into a field or some trees, I'm almost sort of forced to slow down. It's like the world is saying, just exist for a while here, just, just be. Um, and so that is why that is there and leads me 
nicely onto sort of this point that we live in a world that is so go, 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 so focused on productivity and capital. And I think that grinds so many people down. I know it grinds me down. And also the fact that the world is so focused on stuff, on product, on, on go, is also why we're in the climate crisis. It's why we're here now, because we're so focused, or a lot of society is so focused on extraction. And so having access to green space also gives access to rest, to slowing down, to measuring time in a different way. I mean, when I was in lockdown, I started watching the birds in the morning and noticing when different species were coming in and out of the garden or noticing when different um, fungus or plants are in and out of season. And I think when we live in a world that either is heteronormative and your time is measured by, this is when you get a house and a, a husband and kids, and this is when you do all of these milestones or a work life, which is you work from this hour to this hour and these days and you sometimes take a holiday. Having something that is not that <laughs> to measure time by and to connect to can be quite liberating in a lot of ways. And just you can just take a step back and, and flow with it rather than having to force yourself to do something that that doesn't connect to me anyway. And I look at these pictures. I've actually got my background picture on here. Um, the ones on the two edges are from the Welsh Botanical Gardens and the one in the middle is just me doing some gardening in my um, parents' house. And I look at pictures like this and I just feel calmer. I just feel, I guess, more at ease. And there is a lot of scientific evidence to show that when people are in nature or looking at certain colors or certain pictures, their heart rate decreases, their level of stress decreases and they genuinely do feel calmer. Um, and so it's not just me saying, I love trees, go and go and hug one and you feel better. <laughs> Maybe not that literally, but there is a lot of evidence to show that having access to and connection to and spending time in nature is good for people. Um, and then I put these pictures in because as I was going through finding work to um, put in here, I realized how much of my work had nature in it like even when I'd edited extra bits in um, I'd taken pictures like the one in the middle where I'm sat in my room and I'd put the natural world into it um, and I guess it cemented to me how much connection there is there for me and I do just want to highlight because I think there can be a tendency when people are struggling to sort of say oh go go for a walk go do some yoga whatever and that will solve your issues and I don't want to lean into saying that that is that because most of the issues that I and many others face are systematic. So when I'm looking at my work, when I'm looking at climate justice and all of the things that that encompasses, that is part of the system. When I'm looking at in my own life, you know, facing transphobia and ableism, that is all part of the system. Me going out and hugging a tree or foraging or bird watching are not gonna solve any of those issues. But what they do allow a lot of people is the time and the space for this rest and joy so that you can come back fighting. I think there's a tendency in a lot of, especially activists and organizing spaces, whether that's for climate or LGBT issues or any other issues of so many people working from a place of burnout, a place of fear and um, yeah, general exhaustion that I can see why they're working from that point. but you don't get much done and you don't get much out of it whereas if kind of there's a refocus on allowing rest and joy in these spaces it allows people to do so much more than if they're just expected to keep working and burn out and I think that green space has a big part to play in that so that's kind of my main focus on landscape and rest but I just wanted to kind of take the end of my talk to focus on some of the other bits of work that I do, because um, you just kind of saw a lot of pictures of me and not, <laughs> not much of the other stuff that I do. So I'm gonna talk a bit about some of my other work. So um, on the left here, I have, that's a picture I edited as part of looking at the whole culture on social media and what impact that has on people and the environment. Um, in the middle, I have a t-shirt that I embroidered um, for Cardiff Pride a few years ago. I was like, I really want to go and I want to feel like I look, I'm myself. Um, and I couldn't find any sort of t-shirt or outfit online that felt very me. 
and also was sort of ethically and sustainably made. And so I was just like, you know what, I'm going to embroider something. So I have tassels on the front because you'll see burlesque influences in some of my work because I am a burlesque dancer. Not professionally, though, I wish. <laughs> and then on the back, it said tassel twirling queer. And I was just, it felt good to have done that. The T-shirt was from a charity shop. Um, and it was the most me thing I could have worn. And then on the right, we have an embroidery piece I did of my um, friend's burlesque costume. To bring the nature into this, I actually dyed the tool that is her boa um, using red cabbage. It is a very, it is a very stinky process. I will warn you, my whole house smelled like farts for days, but <laughs> it was quite fun. Um, also, as I mentioned at the start, I um, started the Who Made My Pride merch campaign a couple of years ago. This is based on Fashion Revolutions Who Made My Clothes. And it starts in, I suppose it's America's um, Pride Month in June and goes through um, Pride season in the UK. And this is focused on calling out the rainbow washing of big corporations, because a lot of big corporations will come out and they'll say, we love queer people, buy our stuff. And what, um, but without actually doing anything for the people in their supply chains, especially LGBTQ plus workers who are making these clothes, perhaps in countries where it's, it is illegal to be themselves. Um, and so that's what this campaign is focused on. And I've created art to support that. I didn't make the gifts on the right. Um, a wonderful artist called Ellen Jones did that for me. I sent over images. She made them look good for Instagram. Um, <laughs> so yeah, if you wanted to know more about that campaign and get involved, the um, it's Who Made My Pride merch on Instagram. It's still in its infancy, so we're still growing it. <laughs> And then, as I said, I also do a lot of sort of textiles work. Um, I think I put these three photos in because it kind of shows my ideal process. I'm out here visibly mending, sat on the beach in the sun, having a good time. Like, you know, <laughs> um, this is part of the reason I love embroidery because I can sort of take it with me anywhere and just sit in the sun or in the shade, depending on what time of year it is, because I do burn easily and do my um, embroidery. This is some more of my sort of upcycle pieces. On the left, I have a t-shirt that I bought ages ago and then hated the message of. So I was like, you know what? We're not going to throw this away. We're going to change it. Um, and that's the back of that t-shirt I was talking about earlier. And this is actually at Pride. I was at. And then I also have some pieces from protest because I love protest signs. I love looking at them when I'm at. And I think there's so much art that goes into protest. Um, and actually, Carrie ann talked earlier about the um, exhibition currently at the Waterfront Museum and two of my protest signs are in there along with some of my embroidery work. So if you want to see some of my work in the flesh, um, you can see it there. And yeah, I think that just about wraps things up. If you want more of me, I have my website and social media here and another picture of me there. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Izzy. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to say about your work being shown in the exhibition, actually. Yeah, but it's re yeah, it's really nice um, seeing it all together. There. Thank you. Um, so I thought we could just have a little chat now. I'm going to ask you guys some of the questions um, that I sort of did in the interviews for my National Resources Wales project, and um, I, I would also like really like it if anyone would like to answer the questions maybe in the chat as well if you guys feel like you, any of the audience would like to answer the questions as well. Um, yeah, so I just started. So um, the first question I have is, do you feel connected to Wales as a queer person? Um, I don't know who wants to go first. It's up to you. I'm happy to. <laughs> um, I would say definitely yes. I think growing up here and having a lot of my sort of formative queer experiences here sort of connects me. I think I'm also somewhat lucky as I grew up in Cardiff and there's quite a big queer community here. Um, my first Pride, I was in Cardiff. I walked in the parade because I was wearing an LGSM t-shirt and LGSM were working some of them and just were like yes come and walk with us so moments like that really feel like I am connected to Wales as a queer person um but I definitely think yeah a lot of a lot of my experiences okay oh, thank you yeah uh Yenna do you want to have a go answering it um yeah I think in like I think in 
very practical terms, um, I mean, I was really lucky to grow up being involved with really amazing locally organized groups and community projects um, with lots of queer people. And um, that was really lucky. And I think that has really, really helped me um, connect with where I'm from and the landscape in a way that I think lots of other people don't have the opportunity to. Um, but I think in a more abstract way, um, I think, I feel like knowing, I feel like in a more abstract way, um, my biggest connection to Wales is with the landscape. I feel like knowing it so well has helped me feel like I kind of understand myself because I know I connect with and I know my surroundings and that helps me feel rooted in myself as well, I think. Yeah, no, great. And um, I've kind of, I think I touched upon this question, like my answer a lot in my talk, um, but I just sort of like thought, it was interesting when I asked, generally when I asked um, people this in my interviews, like initially they they said no to this question and um, and especially people from like really rural communities. And I think it's just because of like the lack of representation within that, you know, I mean, um, I guess that's something like I did feel when I was younger, but again, like I, I was able to find that connection and that kind of rooted myself in Wales quite strongly because I had that community to like, um, be able to like feel connected to and understood a lot yeah um great so my next question is um what is your relationship to Wales and Wales's natural landscape so um I think this is a really big question um I I kind of i I really think that the, um, I think this is quite dramatic, but I think the physical landscape of where I grew up, which was really rural, um, um, probably about four miles from the main road, um, was, I really think, probably one of the most fundamental aspects of my, like, early development. Um, and I think, I feel like I grew up in a kind of microcosm of the world in such a tiny place with everything in it. Like there's like so much history and language and kind of like culture kind of existed in the microcosm in just one tiny, tiny place. And you had, you might, you probably had to look to find it, but it was all there. And yeah, particularly being that rural, you know, like sharing this space with all these other species and spending a lot of time on your own, I think that really, really um, galvanized my relationship with um, the natural landscape. Yeah, great. Yeah, I think I, I would say I'm connected more to sort of flora, fauna, smaller things than I guess bigger aspects of landscape. I think growing up with um, parents and grandparents who owned allotments and sort of seeing the seasons through through plants and now through foraging and that sort of thing I think I connect to Wales through what is grown here and what lives here rather than bigger landscapes that being said whenever I go away and I come back and I'm sort of on the especially if it's in summer and I'm somewhere sort of hotter coming back I'm always struck by how green Wales is I always forget and I'm like oh yeah it's so green and that kind of hits me as home. Um, so I think that aspect of it, rather than like specific places, it's not stuff, but plants and animals. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's like complete, like I think that is still landscape, isn't it? Like I think I like a lot of like some of the artists, because we we're doing a hyper local residency with um the Hin Lad project, people were focusing on like literally like outside their house, their garden, their doorstep. Like I think the smallest. You know, like anything can be landscape, and that's like how you connect to it. So yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm going to skip the next question. So I'm going to go to um, 
do you think that your queer identity influences your perspective on the environment? Um, I think it's quite difficult to be objective about this one. Um, um, but because I can't see from outside myself, but um, I think my experience, the landscape, hugely influences my, uh, certainly my gender identity. Um, I think, I think the way I identify is largely a product of the place and my interaction with the place I grew up and my interaction with it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think, I think it would be more likely to be vice versa. Um, I think the landscape is more likely to have influenced my queerness than my queerness to have been influenced. Does that make sense? Than, yeah, to, yeah. than my queerness to influence how I see the landscape. I think I very feel much like a product of the landscape and whoever I am and however I identify is, has very much come from a place in my experience with it. I'd say yeah no that's really interesting is it like could you like elaborate like what way did the landscape sort of like have impact on your identity like how yeah could you sort of, could you expand on that um no worries. it was just it was just like my entire everything I learned I mean I was homeschooled as well so I spent a lot of time outdoors I spent a lot of time on my own and everything I've, I mean, all, everything I make, everything I, all my work now is just an extension of what I was getting up to then. Everything I think, everything I do, the way I feel about myself is just an extension of me pottering around the hills then. So I can't really draw any like distinction, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And like mm. knowing you, that like makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, there's a question in the chat for you, Yana, but I'll ask after I go to Izzy. Um, yeah, so do you think your career identity influenced your perspective on the environment? I mean, I definitely think I'm drawn to different aspects that I connect to. Um, I think because as a teenager, I was, I spent a lot of time in parks on my own because I was sort of ostracised. Um, and so I connect to different aspects, like I'm talking about mushrooms being queer culture, because I'm like, oh, something that I can connect to as a queer person that I haven't felt like, not has been explained, but it's like, where has this been all my life? I didn't hear the word non-binary until I was 17. I wasn't allowed, given the language to be myself until I was almost an adult. And so I think that's given me a different connection to different aspects of landscape. And I also think it's, I, I know that as you talked about being queer in rural areas, and I've definitely felt it when I've been sort of more into the country or even just in the area that I'm in, the idea that I have to dress a certain way or act a certain way or that nature is made for and is experienced by certain people. I think there's definitely that aspect in certain areas when you're in the landscape. And I think that's influenced how I've interacted and how I sort of tone myself down sometimes when I've been out and about, especially when I've been on my own. Yeah, absolutely. And like I say rural areas, but I think Wales in general has so little urban spaces and even the urban spaces we have are quite small. And um, in comparison to like the rest of the UK, I think that is like, it's very applicable, those feelings across Wales, like definitely. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Lauren's question in the chat for Yenna because I think it's quite an interesting question. So uh, what are your thoughts on the politics of bringing, appropriating a Welsh rural visual language in an urban um, sort of white cube space environment? And how does being based in London allow you to reflect on your former experiences of Welsh rural landscape, culture and community? Big question. This is, this is such a good question and um, <laughs> something I've thought a lot about and would really warrant a really long answer but I'll try and be quick um um yes so um bringing talking about 
Welsh culture dynamics, talking about Welsh politics, talking about Welsh environmentalism from my now point in London at like a London art school last year was um, quite challenging for me to get my head around and I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure who it was for and I wasn't sure if I wanted to present these histories to people who would not necessarily connect to them. Um, in terms of in terms of the um, the kind of the issues that I wanted to talk about, I think Wales. So, Macuntleth is a microcosm within Wales that um, kind of exemplifies lots of conflicts, lots of um, amazing things, but lots of conflicts going on in Wales to do with um, Welsh identity, the landscape and environmentalism. And I think that is reflected throughout Wales, but I actually think within Wales there, there is a lot of analogies for a much more global problem um, and um, much more global issues of um, um, indigenous struggles, um, kind of um and a conflict between um a kind of westernized idea of what ecologies looks like what environmentalism looks like um, versus those who actually affects first and the most um and within wales that might be um that might be working class people um that might be um queer people that might be agricultural workers and there's these are the people who know the land and these are the people who know most of all um what um what these challenges mean and who these challenges will affect first so i guess i wanted to present it in that way so i think it it was hard but um that's why i decided to do it but um i'm very aware that since leaving wales i'm i have been on the outside looking in and i've been like um researching and like all my research around um all these dynamics I've kind of been very aware that I've only been able to think through these kind of things that I've grown up around having had that distance so yeah but um all I really want to do now is show in Wales really and show my work in Wales that's kind of the next step thank you for the question Great, thank you, Anna. Um, so Emily has popped a question in the chat as well. So have any of you connected with looking at how people of color often don't feel welcome in rural spaces, um, like black girls um, hike, or I feel like I'm not gonna pronounce that with justice, um, but offering the possibilities of a more intersectional analysis. Yeah, I think this is a really super interesting question and it's something that I really want to pursue in my work and uh, it's something like I used to do a lot of um, facilitation work for different youth groups in Wales when I was younger so I worked with like Muslim youth groups and like uh, traveling youth groups and different sort of groups like that and um, like their connection to rural spaces are like so much more like um, like fragmented and um, more complex than like like yeah than my connection basically because I am white and I do have a place like a like a sort of a space within Wales that isn't questioned you know that isn't um put like like no one in sort of like at the I don't you know I have a Welsh accent like speak Welsh I'm from a small community like people except me as Welsh and then yeah I mean I don't think I am educated enough to right now to speak about the struggles of people of colour within Wales um, but it's something I'm really wanting to work with um, I don't know if anyone else wants to talk about it. Yeah I, I followed the work of Black Girls Hike for a long for a while now and it is amazing and I think there's definitely space in Wales for because I know they're based mostly around London but mostly in England um, and I also know um, organizations like Black Geographers although they're focusing mostly on education they're also looking at making things like ecology which then directly um, transfer into the landscape and I know that again I've talked about how 
I have to tone myself or felt have had to tone myself down to be in certain rural spaces. Well, I can tone myself down. You have so many people of colour who talk about their experiences in the outdoors of being outright told that they're not welcome there or they're not supposed to be there. Um, and yeah, that definitely need, is something that needs to change because as I said, rest, recuperation, all of these things are important from connection to the land and everyone deserves a part of that. And when you look at people's access to green space, especially in cities, that is very split um, by race um, and environmental racism. Um, and you look at things like air pollution, and again, that disproportionately affects um, black communities. And so, yeah, I don't know what to conclude there. But I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think that was a really good answer. And like, it's just, it's, these intersections of like marginalized community like working with queer people is inherently like we're also working with people of color also working with like um you know like working class people is also working with like all sort of marginalized communities in my mind like intersect to the point where like i feel that my work does need to um yeah work with like everyone in those communities as much as I can and it's a practice I want to work on and I think we, we're all like very like emerging artists in our career as well and I think this is um the starting points of of things that are going to grow into hopefully um yeah like I just think in Wales as well for me like communities are so small together that like, we are able to make these connections so quickly with each other and growth can be seen so like um quickly like you know we're seeing queer communities and projects and groups grow so quickly over the last year since I've, I've moved back to Wales um and I just think it's going to keep happening for like other kinds of community projects and things as well yeah I hope that makes sense I'm kind of rambling <laughs> does anyone else have any questions for us before we um sort of like end the session or want to have any comments about anything we've spoken about You can speak if you want or pop it in the chat. No worries, if not, that's totally fine. Um, I can kind of ask another question. Yeah. Okay, so do you think encouraging um, queer people to connect to the natural environment in Wales would help build a stronger sense of belonging? I definitely think so, yes. I mean, for me, I've definitely felt more and more cemented with my um, place as a Welsh person, the more I've connected with the natural world in Wales. And I think especially if you feel excluded from those areas, excluded from nature, there's gonna be an aspect of you thinking, okay, I'm excluded from this area of Wales, then how does that mean, what does that mean as a Welsh person? And so I think building those connections does build that sense of belonging. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I guess um, I think like the idea of um, connecting to a natural environment it looks like it's, uh, as um, can look like different lots of different things and can be enacted in lots of different ways. It's um, uh, I guess it's not not just like pond dipping, um, <laughs> um, although that that could be good. Um, but I think yeah, could these connections come about through like storytelling and um, music and all kinds of different ways. It's not just like the, your physical human presence in the kind of outdoor setting. I think it's much more complicated and much more kind of um I, I yeah I think it's um I I think it's also about um reconnecting to ourselves as much as it is to um a perceived natural environment yeah absolutely and I guess for me um I really feel strongly that like having like having experiencing the connections physically like going for walks like with groups of people that you feel comfortable around and like being taken to those spaces so like finding ways of like enabling access to those spaces for people who 
like wouldn't normally have the opportunity to go to the spaces like really vital um to form connections and also like um something that I thought about a lot during my work was like how um like non-accessible like the like ecology like writings on ecology and things are and um I just feel like I've I like you know like I I've gone to university and I am able sort of to digest that information and like that I feel like that's a really big privilege in my life to have done that and um I want to be able to sort of like digest it and then like kind of present it to people in a way that they can interact with it and understand it and like take it with them and like just make sure that this information is able to actually like reach people that it should and not just be like in this academic like bubble that I I mean which I, I really find really like daunting myself even so and I've gone to you know like I've studied you know, I've gone to university and stuff so imagine like people who like haven't taken academic pathways or anything like that like can't access that you know yeah um well, that was kind of my last question but thank you very much for everyone for coming and talking to us and listening and I hope yeah I hope you enjoyed and I'll pass you back to Emily to end the session. Thank you, Kerry Ann. That was really, really brilliant. And thank you, Yenna and Izzy. So much enjoyed your talks. Really lovely hearing about your work. Um, and thank you to Evie Banks from Angetha Cymru for all your support on the two talks that we've done. Like I said at the beginning, but anyone who missed that, the talks are recorded and they will be on our Oriel Martin Gallery YouTube channel probably next week at some point. If you follow us on social media, there'll be a little post about it when those are up. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for coming. Do